2 Chronicles 12, verse starting with 13, um, talks about King Rehoboam. King Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and yet he fell. He fell from grace because he didn't obey God's word. God said, don't marry heathen wives. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. He got a thousand of them. And he helped them build altars to their foreign gods and brought the nation of Israel into idolatry. His son, Rehoboam, took over the southern kingdom after the Civil War. And he established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became a king. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. You know, this reminds me of the United States of America. No other nation on earth has been so blessed as the United States of America. Amen. I love the song, America the Beautiful, from sea to shining sea, with amber waves of grain. Most kids today aren't even taught that song in school because it has God in it. But you know, the woman who wrote that song stood on top of Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs and uh, she looked out over the plains and saw the beauty of the nation and she was inspired to write this song. You know, this nation was blessed beyond words while we sought God. We have leaders who sought the Lord in the early days of our formation. And they established a nation under God. And our nation has turned us back on God. Amen. We don't need God. We've got big government. And we've got China to loan us money. So, it says that his mother's name was Naamah. She was an Ammonite. In other words, she was uh, from a nation of idol worshippers, uh, enemies of God's people. It's one reason you should not marry someone who's not a Christian, because especially if they're not going to be somebody that's going to raise your children up to know the Lord. So Rehoboam grew up to be just like his mother, an idol worshiper. And it says he did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. You know what? You think you can have one foot in the kingdom and one of God and one in the world, and you can't. You've got to make a decision. It's a choice. It is a choice. You cannot live a, a life that's pleasing to God what, with one foot in the kingdom, living. You think just I show up at church and I do my thing and then I'm, I'm good with God, and I'm going to live my life out in the world pursuing the things that the world pursues. It's not... It's not going to work. And that's why so many people in the church are defeated. I want you to close your eyes for another, for just another minute. We're going to play another mind game, so to speak. I want you to close your eyes and, and just begin to see something. I've hidden, pretend, pretend. I was going to put a $100 bill somewhere, but I thought I'd have chaos in the church. <laughs> so we're going to pretend that I've hidden the keys to a Mercedes in this church. And your goal, the first person to find those keys is the owner of the Mercedes. Can you imagine what would happen with everyone in this church if I had told you that? Wow. Imagine it. Just imagine now. We're not done with the imagination. You can imagine chairs being torn, pulled up, looking everywhere underneath the carpet. You'd be dragging the chairs off the carpet to look under the carpet. You'd be up here looking in the communion wafer dish. You'd be looking in the glass of the wine. You'd be pouring the wine up, drinking all the wine up just so you can see if the keys are in the bottom of the glass. You'd be looking in the baptismal font. You'd be looking under the rug over here and the flowers and the trees. You'd be looking everywhere for those keys. And I can tell you what you wouldn't be thinking about. You wouldn't be on your uh, phone with Facebook. You wouldn't be on your iPod with your ear head thingies and your earbuds in your head. You wouldn't be thinking about the election. You wouldn't be thinking about the game after church today, getting home quickly because I've got to go to the game. You wouldn't be thinking about nothing except finding those keys. Now, close your eyes again and imagine that I've planted those keys somewhere on this property. But... I'll give you some clues. 
clues on how to find it. I've given every one of you the same set of clues. Now, imagine what you would be doing. You're going to own, you're going to be the proud, somebody in this room is going to be a proud owner of a Mercedes. Brand new sports car. Red. You know what? Only one of you gets it. Only one. But I've given everybody the same set of clues. What are you going to do? I can tell you what I think will happen. Everybody's out every door and window of this place, looking up under every tree, every bush, through every classroom. But you're following the clues. It's not just random now. You have clues of where to go. Okay? Now imagine I tell you that that set of keys is hidden somewhere in Jacksonville. But I've given you clues and a map. someone, me, who can lead you to those keys. And there's a set of keys for every single person in this room who showed up. You know what? Maybe you don't want to follow me, but I have written down the directions on how to get there. So you can take your time. Or you can follow me and I'll show you where they're at. <coughs> I promise you this, this, this place will be empty. Everybody will be in their cars and running wherever it is that those keys are at. And that is the way we are to seek God. Amen. He's given us clues. He's given us a road map. And he gave us Jesus to show us the way. He didn't leave us in the dark. And he gave us something a whole lot better than a set of keys to a Mercedes. And he's given us an eternal kingdom. And one day, the meek will inherit the entire earth. Way more valuable than Mercedes. More value than that will have eternal life. Will have eternal life. Listen, what God has to offer us in this world and in the next is far more valuable than a red Mercedes sports car. Amen. So, what keeps us if you really know that, then what keeps us from seeking God? What keeps us back? What holds us back? Jesus told us in Matthew 6 what holds most people back. We all know the scripture verse starting with 31. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Your Heavenly Father knows what you need, even before you ask. But, he says, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You see, we're out there continually seeking other things other than His presence. His presence. In His presence there is fullness of joy. We can't find this joy anywhere else. I have, I'm living proof. I've traveled the world. I have lived very nicely. I have everything my heart desires, but nothing satisfies but the presence of God. Nothing is like the presence of God. But you know what? How do I describe the presence of God to someone who's never been in the presence of God? I was going to bring my favorite ice cream on a stick. Magnum. Everybody knows I love ice cream. This is just my favorite on a stick. The one with the double layers of chocolate, Dutch chocolate, Belgian chocolate, and caramel in between. Oh, it's good. <laughs> and you know what? I can stand here and tell you how rich that chocolate is. How soft. And how creamy that ice cream is. But until you put it in your own mouth and savor it, you have not experienced a Magnum ice cream bar. And I can stand up here all day long and tell you how sweet the Lord is. How good He tastes. And how wonderful His presence is. But until you go there yourself, Amen. you can't Amen. understand it. You think I'm a raving lunatic because Connie's crazy. I mean, she's a Jesus freak. Yeah. yeah I sure am. He wants you to come to his party. 
Okay. See, most people are around the world. They're distracted from seeking God because they're concerned literally where they're going to get their next meal, what they're going to wear, how they're going to have water. You know, it takes all day to carry water from the city well, town well, to their house, to bathe in, cook in, drink. It's not very clean. Okay, these people, this is real wants. I mean, needs. They're not wants. Where they're going to live. Listen, I know what it's like to somewhat be poor. I mean, there was a time when I had no money. I was very poor. I was too proud to ask my mom and dad for help. And I found that I had no money for food except I had 17 cents. And back then, a loaf of bread cost 34 cents, so I went to my next door neighbor and asked if I could bring a half a loaf, buy a hot half a loaf of bread from them for 17 cents. So that I can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's poor by our standards. There was a time when I was pregnant with Rocky. I had no money for clothes. My girlfriend made three out pregnancy outfits for me. And that's all I had. And that's what I wore for nine months. I've been to countries where housing is a problem, where they're going to sleep, get out from under the rain. I've been to the Maasai tribe of Kenya, where they live in igloos made out of animal dung. That's why there's flies everywhere all over their faces. I've lived in a 12 by 60 trailer. And that was luxury compared to the people that we were with in Honduras who live in the mud huts. And when the rain washes half of it away, they put a black trash bag on the house to keep the rain out. No flooring, just mud floor. No indoor plumbing. I know what it's like. I've seen these people. So when they're worried about how they're going to feed their child tomorrow, that's a legitimate need. But Jesus is speaking to these people because he's speaking to the poor of his day. Why do you worry about these things? Your heavenly Father knows what you need. He said, listen, get your eyes off of these things and seek his kingdom. Amen. Seek his presence. Seek his righteousness because I'll take care of all this. I'll take care of you. If you belong to me, I'll take care of you. So, you know, he... God, Jesus assures us that there's nothing we need that he won't provide to those who seek him. Amen. Seek him, his presence. So for our nation, people in this church, our country, right now, what we're going to eat, drink, what we're going to wear, where we're going to live, that's not necessarily a big problem, but you know what? We have a lot of other distractions. A lot of other distractions. We've got our iPods, our cell phones, our friends. Our sports, our hobbies. Our sports, our hobbies. Our sports, our hobbies. The pursuit of pleasure. Facebook, iPods, iPhones, computers. All we've got is distractions. Amen. And you know what? That's what keeps us from pursuing the one person who has all the answers and everything we need. Amen. 